Hello, my name is Ryan. And I'm Jade. Welcome to ECTV. Today on the show, we sit down with local slam poet Aaron Gardner, who will talk about his organization's vocabulary as well as share some of his work with us. Then, as we are in the month of October, it's time to get spooky with Ethan Messicker. Finally, we'll be capping it all off with an interview with El Camino principal Cheryl Burns, who will talk about the newly implemented Digital Citizenship Program. But first, let's head in the studio for an interview with Zion and Aaron Gardner. Hi, I'm Zion, and today Aaron Gardner, founder of Spocabulary, is joining us. Spocabulary is a performance poetry workshop at E.P. Foster Library in downtown Ventura. Thanks for joining us. Hey, welcome. Thanks so, for having me. Yeah. So uh, my first question for you is, what is Spocabulary? All right. So sp Spocabulary is a writing workshop, a performance workshop, and a poetry slam that happens in Ventura every second and fourth Wednesday of the month. Okay, so where did you come from? Like, where, where, where are your roots? I My guess? roots? Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm West Coast. I'm a West Coast kid, like, from Seattle all the way down to here. But I, I've spent all my time on the West Coast. And most of my time has been spent in Oakland, California. It's where I went to college. I went to Berkeley. And then I um, became a part of the spoken word scene up there. And then loved it, decided to stay. I taught middle school for like 13 years in East Oakland. And then, um, yeah, and, and then moved down here. So now I, I, have, I have family and things like that in Southern California around Ventura, but um, my heart is in Oakland. <laughs> mm -hmm. So what drove you to introduce the program to Ventura? To introduce vocabulary? Mm -hmm. um, I have an after-school program in Ojai called Blink, and it's a, it's a writing workshop where we do just creative writing for kind of self-empowerment um, purposes. And I wanted a space for kids to be able to share that, to be able to, to actually perform the things that they had written, because mm -hmm. I feel like that's really important. So um, I wanted to make that space. And then I also, a little bit selfishly, miss Poetry Slams mm -hmm. a lot, and there's none around here. So I wanted to start one for myself, too. <laughs> So where and when do you meet? Every second and fourth Wednesday, <laughs> second and fourth Wednesday <laughs> at the EP Foster Library. What time? At seven o'clock is the, the um, workshop portion and eight o'clock is the slam itself. So what is the general age group that attends? It's all over the place right now. It, I've had kids as young as 13 and, and there's a guy there that's in his 80s. <laughs> so it's across the whole board. Yeah, cool. So with different age groups, there's usually like different styles. So do you see the vary, like the variety of poetry and like poetic style in different age groups? Mm -hmm. do you? Uh, definitely. My, <laughs> I'll probably make some enemies by saying this, but my favorite is working with young people and listening to young people's poetry because there's a lot more emotion and passion that goes into it. and there's a lot less of the crafted um, sort of response to poetry, poems that come mm -hmm. out of it. So I feel like younger people, they're more in tune with um, current, you know, popular culture. So they'll, they'll bring in things like hip hop or, um, you know, these, these uh, Buzzfeed type poems that yeah. are out there, you know, they'll, they'll like develop and, or, or adopt those cadences and things like that but they, they're way more prone to make them their own. Older poets are more set in their ways and they, they know the craft really well. So the poetics devices like using metaphors and, and, and alliteration and all those things are all really well crafted, but the heart suffers a little bit, I feel like. Not always, but as a general thing that yeah. happened. It's a nice way of putting it. <laughs> so why is the poetry scene important, especially nowadays? Mm. Poetry is, the language of the soul. It's unfiltered, right? There's, there's very little um, barrier between what you mean to say and what you actually say, which is not true with most writing and, and I feel, or most speaking or most anything. So I feel like having a place where people are able to not only speak 
poetry, but listen to it and hear it is the most important thing in the world. Yeah. I feel like it's probably the easiest and best form of communication because you're sort of forced to listen to it without having a dialogue with it. So, you know what I mean? If you have something yeah. to say, somebody listens to you, but they don't feel the need to interrupt you every two seconds about what you have to say, you know, that they're there to listen. And I think that's a really important thing. Mm. So what is slam poetry? Hmm. And how did you get into it? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. I, I, wrote my, I wrote my thesis in Berkeley on slam poetry and how much it sucked. I thought mm -hmm. it was the worst thing ever because it was a bunch of people all asking for scores. I, I guess I should probably say what it is first. Yeah. All right, so slam poetry is a, um, it's basically a poetry contest judged Olympic style by five random members of the audience. So audience members come into a poetry slam and some five of them get these cards, like a number cards, and as each poet reads, they hold up a score for that poem between zero and 10, and the winner is the poet that scored the best after, yeah. the, after, after the rounds. Yeah. So, yeah, so back to like, how did you get into it, and how did you? All right, so, I, so like I said, I wrote my, I wrote my thesis. There's this guy named Saul Williams, who's mm -hmm. like a pretty famous slam poet. Um, he was in a movie called Slam, and one called Slam Nation, and it was, it was this is in the early 2000s. He was a, it was a big deal back then. And I, and I thought it was interesting. The thing that I was interested in is poetry as, as currency, like people using poetry as a, mo a mode of like, uh, as, as commodification, yeah. you know what I mean? It's like, it's like how, how can I use this to get something else? Yeah. And I thought it was a little bit disingenuous for somebody like that to, like for example, in the movie Slam, he's in the middle of this jail Right, and, he, and he's, he says this poem, and all of a sudden everybody stops fighting, and everything's cool in the middle of this jail. And I was kind of like, that's, wow. that's cool, but yeah. it's not really real. And, right. and I had a problem with it. And then I started going to slams and watching them, and I was like, why, why are all these people just doing this to get scores? Like, is it, is it an ego thing? What is it? But in the process of going, I realized what was actually happening was that the contest part of it was drawing people in, and so poetry was getting a bigger audience than it has ever had ever mm -hmm. at Poetry Slams. I'm saying at, the, at Poetry Slam Nationals, which is the big competition at the end of the year, there's 3,000 people watching the final stage. And that doesn't happen for poetry anywhere. Right. And it never has, you know what I mean? Like it's not a, that's, it's a, it's a pretty amazing thing to see. Yeah. Um, and it's interactive. The people are watching and, and shouting and people are like, you know, there's call and response happening. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty dynamic thing to witness. Mm -hmm. so, I, so, so I got really into it, and then I started performing my own poetry, and I was on a couple teams, went to nationals myself, and it, it's, it's really a, it was really a great community for me, and uh, that's, yeah, that's, that's how I got into it. <laughs> so what makes a slam poem profound, and what kind of draws the audience in? Mm. That's another excellent question. So I don't believe that there's a such a thing as a slam poem. I don't mm -hmm. think it's a genre. I think that you can slam any kind of poem that you want, but people tend to uh, gravitate more towards truth. So like if you tell your truth the best, you're gonna score better than other people. So like what makes, for me, this, this is my opinion, you know, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not a slam expert, but what I believe is that if you get up on the stage and you t you're yourself more than anybody else is, then you'll win that poetry slam. Um, it's, it, there starts to be questions of like, I don't know, how how, uh, how real people are being, you know what I mean? Because it seems like, it's, at points, it does seem like at a poetry slam, people would start to pander to try to get a score. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you're looking at your audience and you're noticing that all of them are a certain like age or, or gender or ethnicity or whatever, and you start sort of choosing poems that you think might, that's, I don't like that part of slam, but um, that doesn't answer your question. What does answer your question is, what makes a poem profound is truth, in my yeah. opinion. Interesting, I agree. Um, so what are some activities, back to vocabulary, yeah. what are some activities that you do during the workshop to help poets improve or maintain? It's, I, the way I run the workshop is, I believe that I don't, I believe that my, expertise is no more or less than any other person there because a poetry slam and a poetry reading and, and honestly any performance 
is based on the audience's reaction to whatever you're doing. And so whoever's in the audience is as much an expert as I am because they're the ones that are listening to it. So what I like to do is I like to just have somebody perform, bring a piece that, you, that you're interested in, in uh, workshopping. You're not sure how it's going to go. Read it. And then the audience, everybody that's there has positives and negatives, and that's it. Like the, we'll always start with positives because it sucks to hear everything that's bad about your piece in the <laughs> beginning. But I, I like to have it open for everybody because, like I said, so there might be different, like conflicting things. Like somebody might believe that, that your poem should be one way, and somebody else might believe that it should be another way. And that's just one way to look at an audience yeah. and be like, all right, so I get to choose, you know? Yeah. So, what would you say to someone who is maybe afraid to get on the stage and speak their truth and deliver a poem, what would mm. you say to them? I would say that it is the scariest thing that you can do, but it's also the most empowering. When you finish, you'll be a different person. And, and uh, that's all you can say to somebody mm. like that. You know, it's, there's no way that you'll experience it without doing it. And uh, the good thing about a poetry slam, and especially ones that, that are curated well, is that the, the environment is all love. There's nobody that's, nobody's gonna throw something at you, you know, <laughs> nobody's gonna talk mm -hmm. smack to you. It's just gonna be like, very, it's, it's very supportive. Yeah. So what would you like to see come from this program, come from Spocabulary? I'd like to see a, a slam team in Ventura. I'd like to see a, a group of poets that get to represent this place in, mm -hmm. at Nationals and, and show them what we got. Yeah. Cool. Well, hope we get there. Me too. Yeah. So thank you for being here today. Uh, Spocabulary course. sounds really great and I bet it's making a real difference in our artistic community. And now Aaron will read a poem for us. I will. Right this second? Do I do it right now? Uh, not sure. <laughs> <laughs> As a boy, I was told, if I were to say the words, white rabbit, as soon as I woke New Year's Day, I'd have good luck for the entire year. On January 1st, 2009, I woke to a text message from a student saying, turn on your TV now. For the next hour, I watched the repeated pixelated images of an oafish looking officer unholstering his gun, gripping it in both his white hands, and taking aim at the back of a young black man laying on his stomach with a boot on his neck. He was subjugated. He was underlined. He was the end of a scream. He was face smashed cement. He was a cigarette butt. He was bang! In the elongated silence, from the people on that train platform to Blocks from my vacation emptied classroom. In the silence before, the reporters began speculating about race and motive and premeditation. Before the word murder began to leak from pink lips, in that silence, I may have whispered those two magic words, white rabbit. The next day, school was in session, and I saw which direction luck was headed. A cavalcade of officers in riot gear, seven strong, stood at the entrance to my school. They were fully armed gargoyles, smiling stone-set grins at the 11-year-olds walking through the door, hands on gun belts, eyeing the parents at the periphery who cautiously approached like antelopes at a watering hole populated by Cheshire lions. The apprehension was bullet holes and drying blood. It was sticky and clotted. The school doors began to look like chalk outlines white rabbit i watched parents in cars drive off with their most precious of cargo still inside unable unwilling to drop their children into the mouths of predators the words protect and serve started to smell like the exhaust from escaping cars started to look like the difference between a handgun and a taser white rabbit one child's mother flinched as I touched her arm, her eyes wide, her daughter clutched close like a purse in a dark alley, her hands fluttered as she backed away. I've never felt more a monster, never seen these claws so distended, white rabbit. This is when I realized that my appearance no longer resembles anything safe. My smile, once used as welcome on any other day, was a maw full of canines and carry-on. My breath carried the stench of dead children on it, white rabbit. When the day ended, after the principal canceled class on threat of riot, I went home and I held my daughter. I know the worst she will fear from questionable decisions is a grounding. 
I know she will never look at a blue uniform or a white face and see a lion or a reaper of children. She will be able to wake up every year on New Year's Day and trust luck enough to be alive and say, White Rabbit, Oscar Grant. White Rabbit, Kamani Gray. White Rabbit, Kendrick McDade. White Rabbit, Irving Jefferson. White Rabbit, Amadou Diallo. White Rabbit, Timothy Stansberry Jr. White Rabbit, Sean Bell. White Rabbit, Aaron Campbell. White Rabbit, Tamir Rice. White Rabbit, Trayvon Martin. White Rabbit, Alton Sterling. White Rabbit. Those are some powerful words. And now let's get in the spirit of things as we take a look at all the creepy stuff on Ventura County. It's October again, and as the leaves begin to fall, decorations are coming up. My family's been doing uh, operating Halloween stores in Southern California uh, since the mid-1980s. So really, I've been involved in a Halloween store in some aspect since I was about five years old. We've been counting down since September. My grandson and I have been so excited. We love Halloween, and we just couldn't wait to start. So come October 1st, we started putting up all of our outside decorations. Uh, it started a little over a year ago. Um, the owner, Jimmy, uh, started it, and then I came in probably like right afterwards, and we both kind of built it up to what it is now. I've always loved Halloween, and just for some reason, scary movies. So many of my memories revolve around the stores, working the stores, being involved in the stores, trick-or-treating afterwards. Halloween for me is not a one day a year thing. It's essentially, uh, Halloween is every day for me. So in, in terms of, of what you see here, these are my favorite memories. All those movies that I gr grew up with and like loved all the different characters were actually you know, made by somebody. And it really like intrigued me into like diving into that and le learning all the little tricks mask making and mold producing, and then it just kind of progressed from there. My mom was great at decorating for all the different holidays, and what she couldn't do, my dad did for us. So we always had the best house for Halloween, Christmas, you name the holiday, it was great. And I remember how much fun it was as a child to look forward to each holiday, and uh, it's just so much fun, and I think there's still a part of me that's a big kid that loves to do this. But why are we celebrating Halloween, and who are we celebrating it for? When Halloween first got big in America, it was a really a holiday driven for children. It was all about the trick-or-treating. That all changed probably around the year 2000 when the adults started taking over the holiday. It's still a kid's holiday, but it's grown into, you know, the adults found out that they could enjoy it too. And there's nothing wrong with that because it's, you know, that's part of the fun of Halloween. Oh, I think Halloween's for everybody, not just children or not just adults. I think it's an, an inclusive holiday. When I was young, I remember how exciting it was when I trick-or-treated houses that were decorated. And it just, to this day, I have lasting memories of that. So I think it's definitely big kids and little kids. But what separates Halloween from most holidays is its kindred relation to death. Everyone that is born has a, an end date that we're not aware of, and everyone's going to die. And I think that Halloween gets us closer to that, that realization, that truth, that life is, is time ended. And, you know, uh, the ghouls and, and the skulls and, and some of the you know, reaper of, of God of death, uh, all, all this really speaks to that. A lot of people are scared of, of it. Deep down, there's nothing wrong with it. Like, if you really research a lot of stuff, it's, it's just how you use it. I do believe it, it's a healthy way to look at life. There's no other day like Halloween. So if we can bring awareness to actually, you know, the aspect that there is death associated with life and Halloween brings that to the forefront, I think that's a wonderful thing. 
it's a part of life you know there's the life cycle and there's uh, black and white good and evil so I think that you know it's something that we include for me I, I kind of do scary fun not scary ghoulish because I do it with kids in mind so that they won't be afraid when they come up to the house. The thing I most enjoy is the baby coffin because it's a really unique piece. It's from like the early 1920s. Um, it was in a old mortuary that they found it in and it was definitely used. It was basically to pick up uh, dead babies in, um, from house to house and it was designed to look like an old toolbox because when you would go to house to house, you know, you didn't want the neighbors knowing that, you know, your kid passed away. So they designed it that way so it was a little more discreet for them. While everyone seems to be celebrating for different reasons, they all seem to be filled with the spirit of the season. I get people that come in and they're inspired by all the different things they see. You know, everybody, just from normal customers to tourists to you know, people that come in every week just to check it out, just, just love it. And I haven't had a single, like, negative complaint about anything. It's much more fun trick-or-treating at a house that's festive than just, you know, going to the door and asking for candy. It's, it's one day of, uh, of the year, and hopefully it'll be a, a national holiday. I know that there is a petition that's circling, and it's so much different than every other holiday that we as Americans celebrate. So this October 31st, whether you're passing out candy or receiving it, we hope you have a ghoulish good time. Spooky. For a final interview, Zion's back again to discuss digital citizenship classes with El Camino Principal Cheryl Burns. Hi, I'm Zion, and today I'm here with Ms. Burns, Principal of El Camino High School at Ventura College. We'll be discussing the newly introduced digital citizenship class and different aspects of the program. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So my first question for you is, what is the digital citizenship class and why is it important? Okay, good question. Um, digital citizenship is just really putting your best self out there, mm -hmm. you know, it's um, a different venue, so people aren't always aware that what's, what they post on social media and elsewhere is followed, and it gets forwarded, and in all of those kinds of things, so it creates what's called a digital footprint, and what we're trying to help students with is to have them realize that they want a positive digital footprint versus something that's going to keep them from getting a job or going to college. So why did El Camino take an interest in digital citizenship? It was kind of twofold. Um, we've had quite a few students that have come to us with um, issues in the past with digital bull bullying, mm -hmm. cyberbullying, and um, came to us kind of as a respite. But I didn't want that to be something that another student faced. So right. it was, we were looking at venues for that. And then also it was something that our district was looking at because it's become such a big issue, mm -hmm. not just with our district, but worldwide. Right. So did El Camino kind of start the chain reaction, or was it? Kind of at the same time. Oh, you know, okay. we, were, we were looking for resources, and then theirs came in. We've kind of you know, played with it and made it, done it in the El Camino right. way, you mm -hmm. know, kind of thing. We're doing it with entire school, doing the same topics instead of each grade level, doing different topics. Mm -hmm. And each year there will be new lessons that are mm -hmm. all intertwined. But we wanted to have a school-wide conversation. Right. So what... Speaking of conversation, what kind of feedback have you been receiving? It's been really positive, um, I w and I was surprised about how fast um, the comments are. Mm -hmm. um, I've had comments from both students and parents saying that there's been some wonderful family discussions over it, and for me as a principal, that's, that's as good as it gets, mm -hmm. you know, when you're having families that are actually talking about issues that they hadn't thought about before. Mm -hmm. And then also with the staff. The staff has told me about some wonderful conversations that have happened within the classroom. Um, some agreements and some disagreements and, you know, kind of com coming to common ground on what is negative impact. Right. You know, different people have different feelings on that, but at least it's a conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what are some lessons taught in the unit? Well, this year we focused on digital footprint, as I had mm -hmm. talked about a little bit more, and also on the cyberbullying. Those were the two things that we wanted to put out there first. Mm -hmm. Why do you think digital citizenship has become an issue? Do you think it's more positive than negative or negative than positive? I think it's almost like a new society. It's grown so quickly that the norms and mores weren't in place. You really mm -hmm. had to 
people have had to kind of figure out that there's a downside to it. Right. You know, it was new, it was exciting, mm -hmm. you know, all of those kinds of things. But it wasn't until um, we started showcasing some of the um, dark side mm -hmm. of it that we really realized that we need to train students to use it appropriately. Yeah. We want it to be something that they can carry on with them when they're done in, done with school. Mm -hmm. So so far, I've seen three units of mm -hmm. it. Are you planning to continue next year, or yes. is it? Okay. Yes, it'll be a four-year cycle. Mm -hmm. um, it's just going to get better. There's so many wonderful resources out there in, in that area, and I think as, as long as we can keep it fresh, mm -hmm. students will be really receptive to it. Right. So from what I've learned, digital citizenship can be a real advantage when it comes to applying for colleges. So what? What are your thoughts on that? I agree with you completely. Um, mm -hmm. It's and it's a new venue that they're looking at. You yeah. know, they're, they're, it's in employers as well. So, making sure you have a positive footprint that's out there. When an employer goes, for example, to look at what kind of employee you would be, you don't want pictures of you know last night's party and all of those kinds of things to right. be the primary thing that they see. You want them to see that you've done community service. You want to mm -hmm. see. And this is for, for college as right. well. They want to see that you have a lot of varied interests and that you're following them. Maybe you're posting a poem that you read. You know, it's okay to have pictures, mm -hmm. you know, appropriate pictures yeah. of you and your friends, you know, kind of thing too, because that shows them that you're social. Definitely. But it's just being really careful that you don't post something that you, if, if you wouldn't show it to your grandmother, it's probably right. not something you want to have yeah. out flying exactly. through cyberspace. Mm -hmm. um, so what are some tips that you would provide for high schoolers who are online and use social media? I think just just giving it a second thought, right. okay? Sometimes we post things without thinking, you know, mm -hmm. and regret it the next day, and it might have been just an off-color joke or a picture that was more provocative than something you normally would have put up. Mm -hmm. So just giving it a second glance to, to um, give it real thought so mm -hmm. that you're give, putting a purpose, you right. know, kind of a thing. Um, and again, that, that tip about if you wouldn't show it to your grandmother, it's probably not appropriate is probably the biggest one that I could say. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us today. Uh, we can't wait to see what positive impact digital citizenship will have on our future. So thank you. I can't wait either. <laughs> Thanks for joining us this time. We'll see you next time on ECTV.